Thank you guys for coming out this evening. I really appreciate it. And as, as uh, we said earlier, thank you so much to all of our sponsors who allow us to be here this, this evening and, and keep us uh, fat and happy with food as well. So thank you, everybody. Hopefully next month when we're here, the traffic will be a little less obnoxious. They said the I-85 bridge will be open on Monday. Is that what I heard? Monday? Awesome. Um, for those of you who are watching this on YouTube but, uh, at home, our, if you may know our, our bridge collapsed. Uh, so we've had a rough year. The Falcons lost. Our bridge collapsed. So we can only get better from, from here. And the Braves lost. Yep. So Tonight, we are going to, to spend some time talking about progressive forms of multiple sclerosis. And, you know, when over the years that I've worked with the MS community, one of the things that I think has always been difficult is when you get up in front of a group of people with MS and we talk about relapsing MS, relapsing MS, relapsing remitting MS, relapsing forms of MS, and we never had much to say about progressive forms of MS. We do now have our first FDA approved treatment for a progressive form of MS. We're going to talk about the, the big picture of progressive MS this evening. Let's see if my remote will work here. So I'm going to throw, a, 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 this is a real life case scenario. Um, this is a 52 year old gentleman. He's in great health. He's active. He exercises. He jogs about three miles a few times a week. And he starts noticing over time that as, his, as he's jogging, um, his right foot is dragging. And this is subtle. It's nothing dramatic. It doesn't keep him from exercising. But as, as time goes on, the point at which he gets weak gets shorter and shorter and shorter. So at first, maybe it's at two miles, now maybe it's one mile, now maybe it's in both legs, it's his left leg and his right leg. And this progressive weakness, especially with exertion, just gets worse over time. Um, so what does that sound like to people? Uh, does that ring a bell? Does anyone have had, the, and I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but has anyone had a story like that? Or, or would, what, would you, what would you label that as? So that's a great description. That would be about the most classic description that you can get for primary progressive multiple sclerosis. Primary progressive multiple sclerosis has always been kind of our, the odd form of MS. It, it, it represents about 10 to 15 percent of people with MS at the time of diagnosis. It doesn't play by a lot of the rules that other forms of MS play by. It's the one form of MS that's more common in men versus women. It tends to start a little bit later in life. When you look at relapsing and remitting MS, the typical age at onset would be sometime maybe in the 30s. Women are more affected than, than men, and it tends to have a little bit more dramatic onset. Um, the other thing that's sort of interesting with primary progressive MS is if you look at, at spinal fluid evaluations, a lumbar puncture, a spinal tap, in relapsing remitting MS over the course of, of that of MS, 95% of people with relapsing remitting MS will have abnormalities in their spinal fluid. Only 50% of people with primary progressive multiple sclerosis do. It tends to be something that affects the spinal cord a little bit more than the brain. Some people with primary progressive multiple sclerosis actually have normal brain MRIs. We just don't see any, any of the white spots there. Everything that they're dealing with is actually in the spinal cord. So traditionally, we've talked about four types of multiple sclerosis. We talk about relapsing, remitting MS, secondary progressive MS, primary progressive MS, and uh, progressive relapsing MS. There have been some new, new ways of thinking about MS in terms of these categories, and we've actually dropped one of those. So now we're really talking about three forms of multiple sclerosis. Still kind of, you know, when you, when you see a slide like this and you see these different boxes, it really makes people want to think of themselves as being in a box. And as humans, we always want to know, well, what category do I fit in? So a common question that we get with, with multiple sclerosis is, what form of MS do I have? And I would say, rather than thinking of, of yourself as being in a box or category, for most people, I would think of it more as sort of a spectrum over your life. Now, I will say, we're going to take primary progressive MS out of this. This is for relapsing remitting MS and secondary progressive MS. Again, primary progressive, we're going to talk a little bit more about. That's, that is sort of the, you know, the, the one that doesn't play by some of the rules. 
If you look at uh, people outside of pro uh, primary progressive MS, there's a point in their life where they've had no symptoms whatsoever. And what you'll see on this graph are the little yellow uh, arrows at the bottom, those are lesions on MRI. This is a person who's had no symptoms whatsoever, but they've got lesions popping up on their MRI. <clears throat> we think in the typical person with a relapsing form of MS, when their MS is diagnosed, uh, that if we could go back two years, three years, four years, maybe even longer, and if we did an MRI, we probably would have seen abnormalities on MRI before they ever had their first symptom. This comes up in real life sometime. So let's imagine that this person who's got spots on their MRI but has never had a symptom, let's imagine they also have migraine headaches or maybe they are in a car accident and they have a concussion and someone orders an MRI on them for, for reasons nothing related to MS and we see these white spots on their brain MRI. What do we do with that? What do we call it? So there is a term now, it's called RIS, radiographic isolated syndrome. So this is the person who has spots on their brain MRI that sure look like MS, but they've never actually had an attack or any symptoms. And one of the challenges is what do you do with this, this individual? What do you tell them? Do you put them on treatment? What studies have shown is that most of these individuals who have uh, lesions very suspicious for MS on their brain MRI, if you follow them over time, they tend to uh, form new lesions on their MRI, and at some point they probably will have symptoms. It may not be for years down the line. So it is one of the struggles. You know, do you put that person on treatment right now? You know, it, that, that can be a tough sell for anyone because technically you can't call that multiple sclerosis, but you know it's the smoking gun before MS starts up. So typically when the person like that really comes into the medical community is, oops, we're not, there we go, is when they have their first attack. So the purple bar is, is a relapse. So when the person has their first relapse, usually then they're gonna go, uh, show up in the medical community. So this could be optic neuritis, maybe the person's lost vision in an eye, or maybe they had a lesion in their spinal cord so they're, they're having numbness. So when you have your first attack, we call that a CIS, a clinically isolated syndrome. So we've got RIS, radiographic isolated syndrome, and now CIS is if you have your first attack. One of the questions in this individual, if they've had one attack, is are they gonna go on and have more attacks? So if you have your one attack and you have lesions uh, suspicious for MS on your MRI, you are very, very likely to actually have multiple sclerosis. If you have those lesions on your MRI and you have abnormalities in your spinal fluid, you're up in near the 100% uh, confidence range that this is MS. If we follow that individual over time, now you can actually call it relapsing remitting MS, so they're having attacks over time. But we're here to talk about progressive forms of MS. So over time, the natural history of, of relapsing remitting MS is that the relapses themselves tend to get further and further apart. But what they're being replaced by is accumulation of disability. So you're now not having as many attacks, but you're not recovering and you're just, you may be slowly getting worse. If we look at the MRI, we see measures of tissue damage. Maybe there's a little bit of, of loss of volume in the brain or spinal cord. We see these things called T1 hypointensities or black holes, areas where the nerve fiber has actually been cut or transected. Those measures of tissue damage we think are the underlying substrate for disability. So if we look at, at, at when people are actually diagnosed with multiple sclerosis over on the left-hand side of the slide, so at the time of diagnosis, most people start with relapsing remitting MS, but about 10 to 15% of people will have this primary progressive form. If we follow people over time, so this on the right-hand side of the slide, this is looking at people 11 to 15 years out, what you'll see now, if we, if we take a cross-section of people with MS, is now we've got a big chunk of people in green there who have, have, a prog have a progressive form of MS. So some of those people with relapsing remitting MS have now sh slowly shifted over towards the other side of that graph that we showed earlier, and now they're in a progressive form of MS. Again, it's always important to know when we show these, these you know, slides like this, this is the natural history of MS. 
the, pur the purpose of treatment, whether it's, you know, you, now we have 16 FDA-approved disease-modifying therapies. The purpose of, of these treatments is hopefully that we can prevent accumulation of disability, uh, if not it, slow it at a minimum, if not stop it altogether. So when we think about progressive MS, you know, the, uh, there are few or no relapses. If you, that doesn't mean there are no relapses. You can still have attacks and have a progressive form of MS. It is more characterized by slow progression of disability than by attacks. MRIs may not show new lesions in spite of the fact that the person may be getting worse. And I will guarantee you there's somebody in this room, if not several people in this room, who have experienced that. And it's frustrating. You know, when you come in for your doctor visit and we say, you know, you had your MRI today and we don't see any new lesions and we're all excited and you say, yay, it's great that my pictures look great, but I'm not doing great. I'm getting worse. And we know that happens. So the MRI is a great tool, but it is not a perfect measure of how people with MS are doing. When people with MS have been dealing with MS for a while, they can physically worsen even though their MRI is not changing. And when you look at people with early MS, you can think back to that graph where we saw those little yellow arrows, they're having attacks and they feel fine. So MRI can be disconnected from how the person's doing in one of two different ways, depending upon where you're at in, in your MS story. Typically with progressive MS, we're looking at measures of tissue damage on MRI, black holes and atrophy. So differences between secondary and primary progressive MS. Again, secondary progressive MS is the evolution of relapsing remitting MS, so that's part of that spectrum. Primary progressive MS is primary progressive MS from day one. It will never be anything other than primary progressive MS. So if you are in one of those you know, regions where you have either primary or secondary progressive MS, we do think that how you got there may be differently, but once you're there, we think the underlying immunopathology may be very, very similar. Both are characterized by progression of disability. Both are characterized by tissue damage with less inflammation. And the reason it's important that we, you know, when we think about that, so do we treat long-term primary and secondary progressive MS with similar medications? I would argue that most MS centers in, in the US and Canada would say, if something works in one, it should work in the other, even though it may not be FDA approved one versus the other. So what are some of the challenges that we see in progressive forms of MS? Well, one of the biggest challenges is we had no FDA-approved treatments for, for altering the course of, of a progressive form of MS. Many of our disease-modifying treatments really target active inflammation, and active inflammation is less of a problem in progressive MS. So your target that you're wanting to shoot at is just not there as much. So that's been a, a bigger challenge. Neurodegeneration, again, tissue damage, much bigger issue. Uh, neurodegeneration has always been tough to deal with. If we had a perfect treatment to stop neurodegeneration in multiple sclerosis, well, we probably would have a perfect treatment to stop Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease and ALS. Those diseases are neurodegenerative conditions. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, there is no inflammation with Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS or Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, when you think about how much trouble we've had treating those conditions, it kind of, that's why part of the reason we've had so much trouble coming up with great treatments for progressive forms of MS. There's been a little bit of what we call therapeutic nihilism on the part of the healthcare community. Nihilism meaning people just kind of pessimistic. They're saying, yeah, we, we can't deal with this. I don't think there's anything to, to offer people with progressive MS. That's incorrect. And we're gonna talk about how not only do we now have an FDA approved treatment, but we've always had things we could do for progressive forms of MS, even when there was not an FDA approved treatment. The other challenge I think is sometimes defining when has a person moved from relapsing remitting MS to secondary progressive MS? I'm gonna give you an example here. 
And this is a real world uh, situation. So Mrs. M is a 48 year old woman with multiple sclerosis for 19 years. She's been on Rebif for 15 years. She's had no relapses, no new lesions on MRI for at least the past five years. But what she does describe is that she's slowly getting a little bit worse. So this is a common situation. Maybe she's going from using a cane to a walker or walker to using an, an electric scooter. So even though she's not having attacks and even though her MRI aren't changing much, she's getting a little bit worse. So is this relapsing remitting MS? Is it secondary progressive MS? She's been on uh, under an injectable medicine for a long time and she's really kind of tired of it. She doesn't want to do shots anymore. So she's bringing up the, the possibility of can I just go off treatment because I don't think this treatment's really doing anything. I'm getting worse anyway. So she stops the, the rebif. We bring her back in three months. She really doesn't feel any different, but on her brain MRI, she's got new active inflammation. So again, it, what it says is that the MRI is sometimes disconnected. She's an example of how the MRI can be disconnected in both ways. She was getting worse and her MRI wasn't showing it. Now she feels okay, not, not better, but the same, and her MRI shows new inflammation. So what, would, what do we label her as? Is, so she was, if you looked at that graph, she's not having attacks, but she's getting worse. So at face value, you would want to use the term secondary progressive MS in her. Um, but when she goes off of treatment, she still has active inflammation. So it wouldn't be unusual for her to actually have this new lesion and have an attack or relapse. So is she really relapsing, remitting? And I think what she points out is that we always need to remember when we're using these categories to describe MS, those categories were meant to describe the natural history of MS. We're not seeing the natural history of MS in a lot of people. We're seeing a modified version of your MS because of the treatment. So she's probably in reality somewhere between relapsing, remitting, and secondary progressive. In the new way that we're categorizing MS, she would be labeled probably as secondary progressive with relapses. Again, one of, and you've, you've probably heard me, me and others say this before, one of the other things we're so nervous about in sticking labels on people is when we're in this setting, when you're in an exam room in a clinic, you know, visiting with your healthcare provider, we can talk about gray areas, about how it's not always easy to, you know, to use the right terminology. Third-party payers, insurance companies, don't deal with gray areas. You're either this or you're that. And if you happen to be that and that doesn't meet the box to qualify for a given treatment because it's not within their, their guidelines, they're not going to pay for that. So that's one of the reasons we're sometimes a little nervous about using the P word, the progressive word in, in, in multiple sclerosis because your third-party payer, your insurance company, could come back and say, uh, we don't want to pay for whatever uh, treatment that you're looking at. So again, things in multiple sclerosis are not always neat. Uh, it's sometimes very difficult to know which, uh, which box uh, people fit in. Some people with secondary progressive MS still have relapses. Some people with primary progressive MS do have active inflammation on their, their MRI. So again, it's not always just perfectly clear you know, how to, to uh, label people. So what do we do for progressive forms of MS? And again, we're gonna talk about the, the first FDA approved treatment uh, in the kind of the third uh, bullet here, but we've always had the first two bullets, even before we had that. We've always had wellness and rehabilitation. And I would argue for people with a progressive form of MS, that wellness and rehabilitation piece may be more important than for someone who's diagnosed with an early form of relapsing remitting MS. We've always had aggressive symptom management to improve quality of life. And I stole this shamelessly from our uh, rehab people, and it's the idea of the bucket of disability. That if you have some disability from your multiple sclerosis, whether it's walking issues, issues with you know, fatigue, there, there are really two ingredients in that bucket. In that bucket, there is damage in the central nervous system, maybe damage in the brain or spinal cord from your multiple sclerosis. The other component of that bucket is deconditioning. So what's the one part of that that we can fix and reverse? It's the deconditioning part. And so when we uh, have looked at, at how people do in wellness programs, so we did a study here looking at, at people going into a 12-week wellness program, 
every single individual that went into that wellness program for 12 weeks did better when they came out at the other end. They were less disabled. Their energy levels were better, their mood was better. Um, so we know that if we take that deconditioning part out, your bucket gets smaller. We don't have a way yet to fix damage in the central nervous system. Hopefully we will someday, but for right now, we know we can fix that, the, one of the two ingredients in that, that bucket of disability. Symptom management, the second part of, of what we do with MS. So when you think about what affects your quality of life right now, you know, for some people maybe it's, it's you know, their gait and mobility issues, maybe it's spasticity, fatigue is always high on the, on the list. Pain, from what we call central neuropathic pain, burning, hypersensitivity, maybe painful spasms, bowel and bladder issues, cognitive issues, skin breakdown, all of these things are potentially treatable. And so even you know, if we're not talking about changing the long-term course, just managing those symptoms and improving quality of life, whether it's through medication, rehabilitation, has, has always been an, uh, an option for us. So why are there so few treatments for progressive forms of MS? You know, why, why are we just now getting our, really our first you know, uh, FDA-approved option for primary progressive MS? Uh, we've mentioned again, it tends to be less inflammatory. Most of our drugs or treatments are anti-inflammatory in, in nature. Um, clinical trials for progressive MS have always been a little more difficult to design. So if you're looking at a, a drug that you think would stop relapses or prevent new lesions on MRI, you can do a two-year trial and enroll people with relapsing remitting MS who have very active MS you know, two relapses a year, maybe a, a couple of new lesions on their MRI every year, and you'll, you're gonna know over two years whether your treatment makes a difference for that individual. If the person is not having active relapses, if they're not having their MRI change very much, if really what you're dealing with is slow progression, that's tougher to, to, to uh, show in a study. You're probably gonna have to look at more individuals in the study. You may even have to study them for a longer length of time. It's gonna be a longer trial, it's harder to show that your treatment's effective, and it's gonna cost more money to do that. So the bar is a little bit higher in progressive forms of MS with clinical studies. So one of the treatments that we sometimes don't talk about very much that has been out there for a bit, FDA approved for secondary progressive MS, is mitoxantrone or, or novantrone. Have, have people heard of this drug before? So, so, not, so, got, so the reason you probably have not heard much about it is because we really don't use it much anymore. So mitoxantrone is a chemotherapeutic agent. It's been used in different forms of cancer for, for years and years. Um, it is FDA approved for both relapsing, remitting MS and secondary progressive MS. When the drug got FDA approval and we started using it in multiple sclerosis, we were aware that we had to be very cautious about cardiac issues. There is a lifetime limit on how much mitoxantrone a human can, can get before you start getting into risk of actually damaging their cardiac muscle. And that damage can be permanent in some people. And if you do that, you get congestive heart failure. So if you, if you dose uh, mitoxantrone the way we typically give it, you could give it for about two years before you said, that's it, that's your lifetime limit. If you receive mitoxantrone, even one dose, you are supposed to get echocardiograms or study of, of how well your heart is working every year for the rest of your life. So it's a pretty big deal. In the, the warnings about mitoxantrone, uh, what uh, we knew from day one, there, there was about a one in 2,000, maybe one in 2,500 risk of leukemia. As the drug got out there and people were using it more across the globe, what we realized is that that risk wasn't, really wasn't one in 2,000 or one in 2,500, it was much higher. And it was maybe as high as one in 100. And the thing that was so frightening about this side effect is you could see it after one dose. And it was a very aggressive form of leukemia with most people dying uh, from this. We had two individuals here at Shepherd, uh, one of whom received one dose of mitoxantrone, developed this leukemia, and, and unfortunately died within about a year of onset. So, so you will, you'll be very hard pressed to see anyone uh, in the United States or Canada at least using mitoxantrone in multiple sclerosis. So March 28th, 2017, we now have our first FDA-approved treatment for primary progressive MS, Ocrevus or Ocrelizumab. 
Um, this is a twice a year IV treatment. It is approved for both relapsing, remitting, and primary progressive uh, MS. The way that this is dosed is your first dose is gonna be split in two. So you'll get 300 milligrams week one, you'll come back two weeks later, you'll do another 300 milligrams, and then you get 600 milligrams every six months uh, on that drug. It is a slow infusion. The, the, it takes somewhere between four and six hours typically to run that, that drug in. So we try to make you comfortable. You're gonna be hanging out for a little bit uh, in the infusion room. The major side effect risk that we're seeing with this drug is the infusion itself. Uh, you can see infusion reactions that might be, you could have itching, you could have blood pressure fluctuations. Rarely you could see true anaphylactic reactions, severe allergic reactions. Um, one of the reasons that most MS centers are very comfortable with ocrelizumab is because we've been using a drug called rituximab for a while. Ocrelizumab is the cousin of rituximab. These are both anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies. What that means, they target a cell in the immune system, a, a type of B cell that has something called a CD20 receptor on its surface, and that's all that, that, that they target. So rituximab's been around for, for a number of years now. Uh, neuromyelitis optica, a cousin of multiple sclerosis, rituximab is sort of the go-to drug for that condition. It is also used off-label in, in multiple sclerosis. Uh, we've got about 140 individuals on rituximab for either neuromyelitis optica or multiple sclerosis. It's my firm belief that rituximab would be FDA approved for MS right now if they hadn't developed ocrelizumab. So what was it that researchers didn't like about rituximab and made them sort of shift their focus and efforts towards uh, the ocrelizumab? Rituximab is, is what we call a chimeric antibody. You'll notice on a lot of these drugs, you've got MAB, ocrelizumab, Tysabri is natalizumab, uh, Lemtrada, alentuzumab. So you've got this MAB, monoclonal antibody is what that stands for. In front of the MAB is a ZU. What ZU means is that it's a humanized antibody. It looks like what we have in our, bo in our uh, body naturally as, as an antibody. Rituximab, rituxan, to my knowledge, is the only one that has an XI in front of the MAB. What that means is it's chimeric. It's a little bit mouse and mostly human. That's what the researchers didn't like. They wanted to take that mouse antibody out of the drug, make it a more humanized antibody. In theory, that part of the rituximab that is, is mouse, your, your uh, immune system could react to that and make an antibody to the antibody and make it less effective. Um, so that's why they switched over to the ocrelizumab. Um, again, a good safety profile. When you're reading other potential side effects of this drug, you will see in the, the uh, package insert a mention of PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. This is a side effect that no MS center ever wants to see. It's a very serious brain infection. Approximately 23% of people with MS that get PML regardless of what drug they're on that, that is responsible for it, die from PML. So we spend a lot of time and effort never seeing PML. We want to not see that pop up. There has never been a case of PML with, with ocrelizumab. The reason that it's in the, the uh, warning label is that with rituximab, the, the sister medication, there have been 10 cases globally. Um, of those, the majority were in the rheumatoid arthritis uh, uh, rheumatology world when the rituximab was combined with other immunosuppressant drugs. There was one in a person with multiple sclerosis. It was an individual on Tysabri for a long period of time, very high levels of JC virus uh, antibody in their system. And the irony is the, they were being switched from Tysabri to rituximab for safety reasons. When you stop Tysabri in a high-risk individual like that, their PML risk doesn't go back to, to zero for about six months. So they stopped the Tysabri, they received a dose of rituximab, and within that six-month window, that person developed PML. Most people believe that really is a Tysabri case, not a rituximab case, but they did receive a dose of rituximab, so you've got to at least count it in there. So what we're counseling individuals is that we can't say there's zero risk of PML with, with this new drug, but it's very, very low. A lot of the individuals that we are looking at for this drug are individuals who may have JC virus antibodies. Maybe they're coming off of, of a Tysabri, and we're, again, we're, we're trying to move them to something that might be as effective as Tysabri, but maybe have a better safety profile. 
So we're excited about this. It is our first drug, again, FDA approved for primary progressive MS. So would we use it in secondary progressive MS? If we do so, it's clearly off-label, but remember we said earlier, a lot of people think of primary progressive and secondary progressive as very similar. You got there through a different path, but once you're there, they're both characterized by similar immunopathology. So I think it would be certainly something on the, the table for, for discussion. Um, again, we, we believe here at Shepherd Center, we want you to know what we know, and we will put anything on the table that's reasonable, talk about the risk-benefit ratio, and see what, what feels best to you as a, as a plan going forward. Folks, thank you again so much for being here this evening. Thank you again to our sponsors for, for helping us be here this evening. Thank you guys very much. Yeah.